Hi, everybody. All right. So, as you know, I'm the only person that still thinks this is funny, but the MAGA Hat Romance series, there are actually three books in the series. So, in the lead up to Garb August, there's six or seven, I think, well, seven if you count August 1st. Uh, there are several Tuesdays between now and August 1st. So I think for my MAGA hat dramatic reading, I will be giving you a reading each week from the third in the series of the MAGA hat romances by Liberty Adams. Woo! But right now, what I'm going to give you, like I said, I think I'm the only person that finds this hysterical, but uh, I decided to do a little bit of detective work about our friend Liberty Adams to figure out, you know, exactly who this person is. I mean, she uh, she has a little clip art. Her, her website is pro-Russian. I mean, incredible. So I want to figure out who this person was. So I thought, well, what's the best way to, to go about this? So I looked up her, so I looked up the publisher of the MAGA Hat Romance series, and it's called Germain Press, and it is an LLC, and the only employees registered to it are a Clifford and Vicky Bendow. Now, Vicky rhymes with Ricky, our protagonist of the first MAGA Hat Romance. Well, actually, is it the first in the series? Yeah. Yeah, Ladies First was the first, so... <laughs> now, big surprise, Vicki Bendow is, lives in Arizona and is a member of something called the Arizona Freedom Alliance and is heavily involved in far-right politics. So that's our house, house mom who lives west of the Rockies. Probably, you know, mystery solved. But here's where it gets really funny. <laughs> Way back in 2010... Oh, and Vicki Bendow appears to have made some attempts at journalism, but m most of what she's published appears to be on this, this Arizona Freedom Alliance website and uh, something called a muckrack. I don't even know what that is. Don't want to know. And a few comments here and there. Definite rah-rah Trump supporter. Uh, and there is actually an interview with with Vicky because way back in 2010, there was a romance writing contest hosted by Rochelle Chase and Lee Michaels. Lee Michaels, those she's got those lovely bodice ripper covers. Um, the name looks familiar, but I'm not obviously not well involved in the uh, in the romance genre. Sorry, I was telling you about the uh, lovely covers. Um, check this out. So, yeah, Lee Michaels has these great bodice ripper covers. So those those do look kind of familiar, but as I said, I'm not really a fan, reader, writer, anything like that. It's just never been my uh, my cup of tea. But... It appears that Ms. Liberty Adams has been attempting to, you know, break into the romance genre for some time before, before her MAGA hat days. So back in 2011, she entered a contest um, called the Chase the Dream Writers Contest. And the winner has the gloriously trashy title of Hooves of Thunder, Hearts of Silk. <laughs> oh my goodness. And uh, according to this interview, um, she did study history of the 13th century doing research in graduate school. So apparently she's she's educated, at least from this claim. So one would think that... Okay, so uh, I am rethinking what I think about her writing about uh, the university. Maybe, maybe it's the 
maybe she doesn't seem to understand that universities aren't like that, or maybe she just thinks that they're like that in the, you know, Northeast or something. I, I don't know. Anyway. Um, reading introduced her to the Silk Roads and the Mongolian Empire at one end of ancient caravan routes that brought treasures, people, and ideas through Asia, Persia, and the Middle East, and all the way to the Mediterranean. The whole thing struck me as a perfect backdrop for romance. What if two people from this different worlds fell in love? So this is actually a romance story about Genghis Khan. I mean, oh, this is so great. Um... So, without further ado, I'm going to read to you a thousand words from our friend Vicky Bendow, aka Liberty Adams. <laughs> Hooves of Thunder, Hearts of Silk. And before I start, I have not been able to find the actual book. So, apparently, she completed the book, but. And apparently, from, from what I gather, it's actually multiple books, it's like a trilogy. But she has either not elected not to self-publish or, you know, she wants to have an actual publisher for it and just has not had any luck. But I'm a little bit disappointed I was unable to find this because, wow. Okay. Hooves of Thunder, Hearts of Silk, Category Historical Romance. East of Samarkand, oh, and by the way, I'm probably completely butchering all of the pronunciation here. I do apologize. East of Samarkand, summer pastures of Genghis Khan, 1226 AD. Yesterday, the slaves cleaned the head baskets. Head baskets, he called them. Their name, long forgotten to him, did not matter. Jakul knew that today the Khan would order their use. When he heard the shouts that Timuji, the Khan's newest bride, had failed to appear, he stopped his work, breaking the yearlings, and hurried back to camp. Rumors buzzed. Ranks of guards and shamans bound wrist to ankle stumbled past him in awkward procession damned. Whether guilty or merely unfortunate, the insides of those baskets would soon be their last sight. Mercifully, they would be spared seeing the spilled blood of those who had met the same fate before them. Jakul looked at the ground, avoiding the faces of the condemned. Instead, he thought of Maja and kept his thoughts pure, unsullied by the hideous recollection of the baskets. Just this morning, the Imperial Guard had brought Maja to camp from the fortress of Igor Terasu, where she served as apprentice to the Khan's elite order of female warriors. Maja was to witness the marriage rites of Timuji, her twin sister, to Chengis Khan, Khan of Khans, the great Khan of the East. The Khan had returned just days ago from a lengthy campaign abroad. No one had dared inform him that Timuji was long gone, kidnapped years ago by slavers. Jakul remembered the day. It was the same day his Maja had been sent away to the order. Jakul knew Timuji's whereabouts. Yerung Kai had told him, but Jakul did not speak of it, even though he did not fear the Khan, and no man had ever asked him. He approached the Khan's enormous gur. I think that's a tent. Gur, G-E-R. Sounds of rage bellowed forth. Swift glances from the corners of his eyes revealed more guards. Doubled over, their bellies erupted with laughter at the rejected groom's comical visage, even as they fled in terror from his temper's deadly clutches. On this day, though, he thought they could laugh. Those whose heads would be spared could laugh. Creeping to the gur's entrance, he drew back the felt that covered the opening, an idol of carved ivory sailed across the tent. It crashed into a stack of porcelain plates, heaped roof high on the women's side. The gur's contents lay in shambles. In the distance, underneath the opening cut in the roof center for the smoke to escape, a servant guarded the fire from the hurled tapestries and silks. To one side, a life-sized jade elephant. <laughs> this is absolutely an enormous gur. Plunder from his conquest of the Karakate lay askew, tipped over stacks of wooden chests and tables. A wretched howl rang out. I will not be made a fool. A voice sounded in response, not the Khan's woman, a man's voice. Yerun Kai. Chakul could see his bowed head humbled. He spoke in soothing tones, not mocking. Lay your curses upon them. The Khan's voice broke, his words stalled by sobs of fury. He swore on Timuji, her father, and Maja too. 
Yet no shaman appeared to invoke his oath to the gods. Yerenkai said nothing. Instead, he kept low. I can bring her back, Jakul heard his whisper clearly. Your quest for a race of master warriors shall not be denied. Yerenkai's words calmed the aging ruler. At the mention of his legacy, the Khan's eyes lifted, dark points beneath sparse brows, gray with age. His face softened, but his tone remained harsh. Find her. She is to be mother of my issue. It will be as you say. Yerenkai's head came up. Jakul heard his name spoken. Jakul must accompany me. The Khan's eyes narrowed. The air grew still. His head jerked in the direction of the stables. Impossible. I trust my steeds only to him. The anger began to rise again. Jakul sensed another outburst. No man would dare to speak to the Khan this way except Yerenkai or perhaps he himself, although he would never have cause to say these things. He held his breath. Yerenkai kept his composure. Quite so, wise one, but the great Khan knows that such a journey requires the most skilled of your agents, and your bride the protection of your strongest and fiercest man. The Khan's chin turned in an abrupt upward motion. <laughs> the routes are safe enough. Yerenkai remain, remained stubborn. Fascinated, Jakul watched the haggling. Yes, the great Khan's might extends further than any man's imaginings, but haste is a necessity, and who better to escort your precious bride back to your waiting bed? A snort. Yes, she shall come to my bed. My shaman's decreed it, even before her birth. He leaned back, an air of lofty self-satisfaction crossed his features. The corners of his mouth turned up. And the other, she waits here, yes? He trained his expectant gaze on Yerunkai. She will receive my seed instead, and if she conceives, she may take the place of her sister. You know, that's actually not that bad. Hilarious title notwithstanding. I mean, you've got stakes, you've got an interesting setting. I would read more. So I hope you're reading lots of horror. Getting, gearing up for Garb August. It's going to be a lot of fun this year. Have a great day.